Hi, welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. Well, the legislature is coming to a grinding halt. Can it get any of its big agenda done? And then we have the chancellor of the state system of higher education to talk about all things higher ed following these words. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, a fast-paced, unrehearsed weekly discussion with and about the leaders who shape your world. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Hi, welcome back to the program. Well, as we uh, tape this program, uh, the big annual uh, trek to New York City known as Pennsylvania Society is underway. I want to chat with our guest, uh, one of the state's leading journalists, John Meisick from the Allentown Morning Call is sitting across from me. And then we're going to get John Cavanaugh, the chancellor of the state system. We're going to talk about the future of higher education funding and some other issues with public higher ed in the uh, second half of the program. John Meisick, welcome. Good morning. All right, let's, let's first of all have a little fun and talk about 1899 Pennsylvanians, a small group began to go to, people who lived in New York had a big party and it became an annual event. It, it's, it's turned into, I don't even, a, a mecca. New York is a mecca for this weekend. What, what's this PA Society all about? All right, well, let, let, let's start with this. The ostensible purpose of the weekend is a big dinner on Saturday right. night at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in the ballroom uh, where they're going to honor some worthy Pennsylvanian for their contributions to the, to the life of the Commonwealth. I mean, this started back in the turn of the century when all the robber barons right. living up in, up in New York City would invite their buddies up for a weekend of, of reveling and parties and then you know, the, the men would retire to the back room literally with cigars and cognac to divide up the world between them and decide <laughs> who, was gonna, who was going to run for what that, that in the coming, right. the coming year. And, and now it's become this, I mean, is the de facto kickoff to campaign season yeah. in even numbered years. In 2010, is the big, 2009 going in 10, it was the big coming out party for Tom, Tom Corbett, Corbett and his gubernatorial right. campaign. Uh, this year it's going to be the nine Republicans running for the United States Senate. It's like the traveling company of Godspell or something. Yeah. <laughs> and and there's, there's a big debate on Friday afternoon in, in, um, in the Park Plaza Hotel. Right. The there's Plaza, no less. Yes, the, the Plaza, the plaza. No less. I've told my daughter I'll look for Eloise, by the way, in there the hotel. Go. But um, <laughs> you know, there's receptions across Midtown all weekend. And this is really the place to go where you want to plant the flag and show yeah, your, yeah. ironically enough, a hundred and more miles away from a, any piece of turf in Pennsylvania where you go to plant your flag to show your seriousness that of you're intent run in as a political personality. That's a good point. And, I mean, literally we're talking about several thousand now Pennsylvanians who trek to New York to, to go to a series of parties one after another. There's probably 40 or 50 of them. I looked at the oh, schedule, yeah. and I'm going to be there. I mean, I'm there, and so we'll see. I'll come back and I'll give you a report. No, you're going to be there. I don't well, have we'll to see give each you other a report. There, yeah. All right. Let's, at any rate. And it gets bigger and bigger every day. And it gets bigger and bigger. All right. Let's talk about, John, what, a couple of things. Let's talk about, I want to talk about uh, uh, modifications to Megan's Law. I think I got this right. Given the, san the events in, uh, in Penn State with Jerry Sandusky, this has taken on sort of a new added importance to, is it about bringing Megan's Law into the 21st century, is that a way to put it, or is it about expanding, it's, what, go ahead. What it really is about, Terry, is about bringing the state's Megan's Law statute, which requires right. convicted sexual offenders to register and have their photos and fingerprints taken with local law enforcement into compliance with a federal, uh, federal yeah. law known as the Adam Walsh Act, named for the son of that television host, John right. Walsh, who was killed some years ago. Um, that law was enacted in 2006, and the feds have given extension after extension. So far, only 15 states have come into compliance with this Is law. Is it that difficult to come into compliance? It, the states complain that it's actually kind of expensive for them to enact this. Um, it's going to cost Pennsylvania about $3 million. Oh, to enact. out of $28 billion? $3, I, $3 million? I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, not just the, I'm not the one who's You're making the arguments of the states are complaining that with budgetary crunches, yada, yada, yada. They say it's too expensive. Um, there was a genuine push this past week, and it looked like it was going to happen, and the, the vote sort of fell by the wayside um, to, with, with, with bills that would brought the state into, now, into compliance what, what, with the feds. Give us a couple of things that the state would have to do that okay, it's the, not there, doing now. There are two things, and two, actually two glaring loopholes um, in state law that this federal law, that by adopting the federal language, it would close. The first one is, is that it would require um, homeless and transient offenders to register every 30 days 
with law enforcement. The complaint from law enforcement has been that, that you know, there are some number, because of restrictions in, in residency and that kind of thing, of convicted offenders who are homeless. Oh, well, how do you find them? Well, that's, that's the problem. So how do you make somebody who's homeless who's, like, moving from street? I don't get that. You, you can't, but they want them to register every 30 days so they can at least try to keep oh tabs on the gosh. substantial population of people. The other one is, is actually fairly interesting. This would require, back it up. People who move here from out of state, convicted, from, convicted in other jurisdictions who move to Pennsylvania, are required to register with law enforcement in their new community. The problem is, is there's actually no criminal sanction in Pennsylvania law that penalizes them if they fail to register. Wow. A weird loophole, who knew? Yeah. But this federal law now has, it would make it a second-degree felony, and if yeah. depending on the seriousness of the offense this person yeah. is convicted of, a second or third degree felony if you failure to, regi well, for that failure would to seem, register. John, that would seem fairly easy to do compared to the first big change. Am I right or wrong about that? that would, I mean, both of these fixes are comparably easy, and it's one of these things yeah. that everyone can seem to agree on, particularly given recent circumstances, which makes it sort of all the more inexplicable that given the, the, the seeming obviousness of these, of these, of these bills, that it didn't get a vote last week. It came out of committee. It seemed like it was poised, and then for whatever reason, it didn't make the it. vote didn't happen. All right, we're going to run to a break. When we come back, uh, congressional redistricting is coming up. Uh, it, it, you know, who's going to be your House member? Does it matter? <clears throat> we'll be back in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania Cyber Charter School bringing educational innovation and freedom to the children of Pennsylvania. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by ReconnectPA.org supporting a comprehensive transportation funding solution and by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association business in Pennsylvania is our business hey welcome back to the program with John Meisig from the Allentown morning call we're talking about the legislative session is grinding to a halt John before we get into congressional redistricting you know the boundary lines that will determine uh, house uh, congressional members uh, for the next 10 years let me talk about the action or lack of action, I should say, on a lot of these big agenda items. Is there going to be some moment in the next week or two where you think lots of legislation just simply spills out and gets passed, or is this gridlocked to the bitter end? You know, it's, it's hard to call right now. The, I'm, I, I'm inclined to say that a lot of these, these big ticket items, um, school choice and so-called impact fee for Marcella Marcella Shale, Shale, natural gas drillers, is going to get bottled up and may not see action until next year. Um, the state senate is only in session through Wednesday, the um, I guess that's what the fifth, uh, the fifteenth yeah. of December, next Wednesday of the coming week, um, and they're pretty adamant about leaving um, unless you know unless there's some deal deal or eureka out. eureka moment. Okay. Um, you know, as of this taping this mm -hmm. morning, it looked like things were still bottled up on the. Um, gas fee for the, the impact fee rather for gas, gas. drillers um, the senate republicans really don't like this county optional language right. they want to see it imposed statewide governor corbett yeah. wants to see a, a county and never the twain yeah. the, the point that john has just made here is that uh, there's a proposal that would allow each county to decide to impose an impact fee the impact fee itself would have parameters to it that's right. but it would be a county decision as opposed to a, a state decision. decision is that that's right? right yeah governor corbett wants to lead the county to impose whether or not to impose it right um, the senate republicans want a uniform statewide fee so that's stuck um, there's supposedly talk going on with school vouchers you know right. where you could use taxpayer money to send your kid from a troubled district to the school of their choice that seems to be bottled up in the house um, there's disagreements over whether or not it should be sunsetted. The, the Senate Republicans don't want to see it sunsetted. The House Republicans want to see it sunsetted after a number of years. Uh, disagreement about the scope, about who should be covered. Um, and these, I mean, these are big, gigantic issues. And there are meetings There are big differences, there are too. There are big differences. There are supposedly meetings going on throughout. Governor Corbett said earlier this week that he's been meeting with House leaders to try to reach some kind of agreement. Um, the House is in session through December the 
20th. Right. They'll be in a week later. The week later than the Senate. So The Senate could stay another week if, if they can. If there's a eureka moment right now, there's not a lot of reason to okay. be Okay. The last thing I want to talk to you about is moving next this week into congressional redistricting. It was postponed. We're going to see the maps. G give us just sort of the outline of what we think we know with the understanding that it could change. All right. We'll, we'll preface this with the fact that every 10 years, because of the United States right. Census data, they have to redraw the state's congressional maps and the legislative maps. Pennsylvania, because of a population loss, will lose one congressional seat, going from 19 to 18 seats on Capitol Hill. That means it's like a game of volleyball. Everybody rotates and gets stretched, and you have to figure out where to put right. bodies and that kind of stuff. Um, it looks like you know there's some there'll be some a lot of tweaking in the West, which has not grown as quickly as the rest of the state. Um, a fair amount of drama in northeastern Pennsylvania as well, with some tweaks to the 11th district seat of Republican Congressman Lou Barletta, um, and to the 17th district seat of Democratic Congressman Tim Holden. Basically, those two districts, Congressman Barletta's district is based uphill in Wilkesbury, Hazelton. It looks like it's going to kind of the anchor is going to kind of flip flop and be right. down Dauphin, Lebanon counties, um, whereas Mr. Holden's district is going to stretch farther north and farther east into, into Scranton, particularly Scranton, into Scranton, um, and in fact into maybe even into Easton um, in my newspaper's right. circulation area as well. Right. So there's all of these meetings going on. Um, so the map, we'll get the maps this week, and you know we'll see where that all goes. And the legislature actually. We'll do this in, by passing a law. It could do it in January. That happened in '91. It's it's, it's messy. Uh, and petitions begins. Candidates begin circulating their the nominating petitions January. on January the 24th. Um, you know, if they do nothing else, they've got to do this one thing just so it's not a gigantic hairball for all the candidates. All right. Thanks for the great update. All right. Coming up, the Chancellor John Cavanaugh. We're going to talk about public higher education. Stay with us. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. Pennsylvania Credit Unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, check out ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the State System of Higher Education. 14 state-owned universities, the state system is the largest provider of higher education in Pennsylvania. And by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, working towards a healthy Pennsylvania. Hi, welcome back to the program. Or joining me as uh, sometimes, often is the case, I guess, as a chancellor of the state sister, system of higher education sister well through, we have a lot of sisters and brothers don't we right. in, the, in, in, the, in the 14 schools all right as john uh, cavanaugh chancellor let's start out uh, by talking a little bit about uh where you think the future of public higher ed is i want to get into the funding cuts mm -hmm. and how that has affected the schools but you you educate take take us through sort of the big picture with in terms of the state system schools sure uh, it's great to be back, Terry. Uh, I, I always enjoy the, this opportunity. Our pleasure. Uh, public higher ed, I think, still has to play a major role in the quality of life of the Commonwealth and, and in every state. Um, it's very important for us to continue educating our citizens for the um, republic that, in which we live and the democratic form of government that we have. So that's a, the, the public purposes of, of why we exist. Um, it's also to help provide service to, to the Commonwealth. That's another aspect of the public, public side. Having said that, um, we also need to be responsive to the needs of, of the Commonwealth, and we're doing that as much as we can. Um, we're doing some very exciting, innovative programs like professional science master's degrees in which we provide advanced training in a content field, let's say um, chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, and instead of a research thesis, we, we put in the core of an MBA degree so that a person working in a pharmaceutical company has the management and accounting and finance background in addition to it, um, additional chemistry background. So we're, we're implementing a number of those programs. And we're also being quite innovative in creating what, what's called a 2 plus 2 plus 2 uh, progression, where the first two um, could be, let's say, a career technical high school. Mm -hmm. 
um, and a student goes and, and acquires some, so, some skills there. Second two is a CUNY college where a student might get uh, an, an, an Associate of Applied Science degree. And then the third two would be one of our institutions where the student comes in, finishes out the general education right. requirements and, and some tweaking in the major, yeah. ends up with a bachelor's degree. Yeah, one of the things that, you know, as in, all, in all fairness, I've spent uh, more than 30 years in uh, Millersville, one of the public universities, obviously, in the state system, just to get full disclosure out here. Uh, one of the things is the huge number of alums who remain in the state and right. make an invaluable contribution, I think, unlike other schools where, you know, the folks tend to leave. Uh, you know, we're a net importer of students, but an exporter of graduates, but not, you finished my thought here, I know That's you right. can. Uh, well, you know, 90% of our students come from, uh, from Pennsylvania, right. and over 80% of them stay after they get their bachelor's degree. So, we really are creating the future of the Commonwealth uh, through our, our students and, and our system. All right, well, let's shift gears now to uh, talk a little bit about, look, obviously, the state system and the state-related schools, Pitt, Penn State, and Lincoln, Temple, universities went through a really horrific budget cycle. I think that's, I can say that you can be more mild about how you want to put it. Horrific budget cycle, 50% cut was recommended. You got, what, 18% cut in your right. budget. What, what impact has that had uh, with, let's first of all talk on programmatic. We're, we're, did it have a huge impact on programs, a modest impact? What, what's your sense of that? Sure. Um, first, you know, let's understand that uh, that 18 percent cut meant about $800 per student that we lost in, in state support. And our board um, held good on its promise that it was not going to put that cut on the backs of our right. students and their families, and they didn't. Um, right. um, and it left a, about a $33 million hole for the system. What that's meant in, in, you know, on the heels of additional cuts that, that have happened over the last decade is that we've had to take a look at low enroll programs, and, and a number of those have been put on moratorium. Right. Many vacancies have not been filled. We have fewer adjuncts, adjunct faculty at, at many of our institutions than we used to, and class sizes are, are bigger than they used to be. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, the, the newer programs that we just talked about um, are, are coming, so it's not all bad news. Right. But we still have tough choices to make. It's not going to get better anytime soon. We I know think that. that's true. Um, it's probably right. four or five years before we get out of this. So our, our campuses will continue to take a look at um, the, those, those programs, the mix, and I want to commend um, the faculty in particular who have been working with us to create collaborative programs right. so that you don't have to have 14 copies of everything, right. that sense. they can work across institutions and create collaborative programs, yep. collaborative majors, yep. share resources, yep. and we're doing a whole lot more of that. Okay, we're talking with the uh, Chancellor of the State System of Higher Education, John Cavanaugh. Take a break and we'll be back. We'll talk a little bit more about the future of public higher education. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by Highmark Blue Shield, changing the way health plans work for business with a variety of plan options for employers and more choices for employees. Information is available at Highmark.com. Have a greater hand in your company's health and by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, the future of long-term care. Hi, welcome back to the program. All right, uh, Chancellor, let's talk a little bit about, uh, there's a uh, act known as the Higher Education Modernization Act, and there's a series of bills before the legislature that relate to that. Why does that matter to you? Why does that matter to the state system? The most important aspect of the Higher Education Modernization Act is to create a level playing field for the state system compared to all the other institutions mm -hmm. uh, of higher education in Pennsylvania. A couple of, of examples. One, um, our faculty are, are, are really barred from doing the entrepreneurial company starting mm -hmm. uh, activities that many other institutions do and, and people just take for granted. Is that because it would be a conflict of interest conflict as of a interest. state employee to run a part? Go ahead. Right, yeah. to, to have a financial stake in a, in a company and right. maintain your faculty p position. Secondly, there's the issue of, of fundraising and as a state employee, again, raising money on behalf of a 501c3 foundation, even though it's student scholarships, you know, 
the, the courts see all nonprofits as the same, whether it's a campaign PAC or it's a, it's a university foundation. Right. So we need to, to get permission for our presidents and, and others to go out and look at a donor and say, we'd love for you to support our scholarship fund. Um, See, that seems like no, no brainer. But it's, you know, it, it, it's a well-intentioned... Yeah, I um, get it, but it seems like in today's... Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we have, to, we have to do that, obviously, because we're looking for of ways to, to raise our own revenue. And you should right? have that ability to do that. And um, the House uh, felt that way. We, had a, we got a unanimous vote for that. And, right. and it also includes uh, uh, the opportunity for uh, the 13 other institutions besides IUP to have applied or first professional doctoral programs to meet, yeah. to meet Commonwealth needs that we were talking about right. earlier. So that, that set of, uh, of ideas has passed through the House, um, uh, got a, floor, a unanimous floor vote, right. and is now um, in front of the Senate in, in a number of, of separate bills. So one of the things that we'll have to, to, to talk with them about over time mm -hmm. is how to reconcile all that. But we had a, a unanimous vote in the Senate Education Committee um, at their recent hearings. So we're optimistic that um, over the course of the next next several months that that all of these will be will be taken care yeah. of. Yeah, back back to the funding I issue. I mean, I think that's the critical one. The funding for the state system for the public schools is about a third. Is it about a third of your budget, or is it a little more? I thought it's a little I, less. A little less now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now historically, however, if you go back twenty or thirty years ago, it was it was up. I thought at one point to about two thirds. It's about two thirds when we started as a system in nineteen eighty three, and now it's down to around twenty seven percent. So, in other words, a state-owned school only twenty eight percent of the money comes from the state. Cor correct. Why don't I? Does that not make a whole lot of sense to me? Uh, you know, I know you can. I, put, I always put you on the spot. That's what right. I'm supposed to do. I don't quite get that. I mean. At some point, then, what you're arguing for is if you're only going to give us a certain amount of money, then loosen the reins. That's right. So don't bottle That's us right. up. With let let us have the entrepreneurial yeah, opportunities yeah. that other people have right. um, to help ourselves. Yeah, what, what were well-intentioned right. th laws 30 and 40 years ago don't actually apply now, right? That's right. All right, we have about a minute left. Uh, how Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? I know it, oh, I'm, absolutely, I'm absolutely optimistic about the future because, uh, first of all, our focus is on the students, and they're terrific. Secondly, yeah. um, the creative people that we have among us in, in the state system, they, ha they have the, the foresight to create wonderful learning opportunities for mm -hmm. our students, and that's really what it's all mm -hmm. about. And you're still basically, and this is important, Educating Pennsylvanians who remain here. That's right. Who, who are productive citizens. I sound a little bit like a cheerleader, but that's a fact. I mean, it's not. That's what we do. Not, it's not making that's it up. That's what we do. We help create the future of the Commonwealth. Yeah. Well, look, I want to thank you for coming on. When you have, uh, you know, come springtime or late winter, their programs, their developments, certainly going to have you back when we get into the budget and uh, we'll see what we can do. All right. As always, thanks for watching this edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers and uh, stay well.